Hello and welcome to Bay College's video lectures for Intermediate Algebra. We're going to look at section 6.6, .6, which introduces complex numbers. Now, up to this point, we've only dealt with real numbers. When we had a negative under an even indexed radical, we would say there's no real solution. And we specified real because there is a solution. The only thing is, it's in a complex number system. So we're going to introduce the complex number. But first, let's see where we actually experience a complex solution. Now, if I look at this example here, we have x squared plus 4 equals 0. If I attempted to factor this, because it is a, uh, a quadratic, we have an x squared, I'd say, well, this doesn't factor. This would be prime. So maybe I want to solve it some other way. Maybe I can introduce a square root. If I subtract 4 from both sides, I would get x squared equals negative 4. And maybe I'd identify, hey, there is no value squared that gives me a negative, at least not a real value. So let's introduce a square root here and say, well, if I take the square root of both sides, I can get rid of that squared value. So if I introduce a square root, what I do to one side, I do to the other. Now remember, we're actually raising it to a um, rational power. We have to introduce a plus or minus because it could be two different values. And we have to remember that every time we introduce a square root. Well, the square root of uh, something squared just gives me that value. The square root of x squared is just x. The square root of negative 4 plus or minus the square root of negative 4, this is not a real value. So we have to come up with some way to deal with this. And what that is is the complex number system. This can actually be simplified if we just for a moment say, you know what, I can factor out a negative. Because 1 is the factor of every number. So let's do that. If I factor out a negative 1, this is the same thing as the square root of negative 4, because we can use that product rule of radicals. I can now simplify this. x equals plus or minus the square root of 4 is 2 times this square root of negative 1. Now that I was able to isolate that out, I can see, OK, well, it'd be plus or minus 2 if that negative 1 wasn't under that radical. This is what makes the complex number system. This is the only new value in the complex number system that makes it differ from our real number system, the number system that we're familiar with. Complex numbers in a standard form are written as a plus bi, where i is the square root of negative 1. It's just a symbol that we use to indicate the square root of negative 1, a lowercase i. So the complex number system, a is a real number, like 4 or 6 or 2 or whatever. It's a real integer or fraction or whatever. And b is the coefficient of the square root of negative 1. If we look at what we had here, we have the square root of negative 1. Its coefficient is 2, 2 times that value. So the complex number system written in standard form, a plus bi. Now, we can break that down into further categories. If b is 0, we would just have a, which is the real part of the number. That's the real number system that we're already familiar with. a plus bi, if b is 0, all we have is a. An example would be 4. 4 is a real number because the b value is 0. So there is no imaginary part. The other side of the spectrum is the imaginary numbers. If a isn't 0 and b isn't 0, we have an imaginary number of something plus a coefficient of i. But we can break this down a little bit further, because what if one of these values isn't 0? Well, we already looked at if b is 0, we'd have just a, a real number. But if, there, um, if a is 0, we have what's called a pure imaginary number. A pure imaginary number, if a is 0, we would just have b i. And that's purely imaginary. We have an imaginary number times some coefficient. So we call that a pure imaginary number. So this is the new number system that we're going to be familiar with. And we call it the complex number system. The only introduction is the square root of negative 1, which we call i. 
All right, so let's uh, explore that imaginary unit a little bit more. Why do we have it? It's so that we can deal with uh, things like the square root of negative 4, so that we know what to do with it at that point. And honestly, it does tell us something. As we explore more into math this semester, we're going to see uh, when it comes to graphs, we might be asked to find intercepts. And we're going to find, well, they're imaginary. Well, that does tell me something about the graph. It tells me it might be above an axis or below an axis. And it's called the imaginary unit because if we can use our imagination, it helps us see the behavior of the graph. If I could imagine a sign change, maybe I would find some intercepts. So let's explore some of the properties of i because we're going to be doing mathematical operations in the complex number system. So we have to know some of the uh, properties of i. One of the properties of i that we might come across is we might have to raise it to some power. If we have uh, i to the first power, well, by definition, i is the square root of negative 1. But what if we have i squared? Well, if we have i squared, it is the square root of negative 1 times itself. And if we re recall our quotient rule, well, essentially, or excuse me, not my quotient rule, my product rule, the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1, it's a square root being squared. When we square a square root, we get what's under the radical or the radicand. Well, our radicand is negative 1. I'm squaring that square root. So I get negative 1. i squared is a real value, and that real value is negative 1. What if I have i cubed? We have negative 1 times the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1. Well, if we think about this in terms of the last one we just multiplied, it just has one more factor of i. So if this is the negative 1, negative 1 times the square root of negative 1, well, that's just a negative 1 times i. By definition, it would be negative 1 times i. So i cubed is negative i. What about i to the fourth? Well, i to the fourth would be four factors of the square root of negative 1 multiplied together. Now, if we just assess it, it's one more factor of this. So it would be negative i times one more factor of i, or negative i squared. If we go back, well, i squared was negative 1. A negative negative 1 would be a positive 1. Or we could look at it this way. Here, the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1, we know that to be i squared, which is negative 1. If this is negative 1 and this would also be negative 1, negative 1 times negative 1 is a positive 1. So if you look at it in either one of those two ways, you still come to the same con conclusion. i to the fourth is equal to 1. Here we have i to the fifth. Well, i to the fifth is just one more factor than i to the fourth. So I can take this value and multiply it by i. Well, 1 times i is just i. i to the sixth would be one more factor of i than i to the fifth. So I'd get i times one more factor of i would be i squared. We already know i squared is negative 1. And if we continue that, we're going to see that this is a repeating pattern. The only four options that we'll ever come out with, no matter what power we raise it to, is one of the first four. It's either the square root of negative 1, which is i by definition. It's going to be negative 1, negative i, or positive 1. So essentially, these are the only four we really need to know. And I'm going to put a little asterisk by this one because this is the most important. Because this is a real value and it's conveniently positive, we can actually use this to determine what i to any power is. Here's the example. If I'm asked to simplify i to the 41st power, I'm not going to go through a list of numbers and to determine what is i to the 41st. What I can use is I can use this as my tool. If I know i is the square root of negative 1, i squared is negative 1, i cubed is negative i, and i to the fourth is 1. If I divide this power by 4, I will know what version of i it is by simply looking at the remainder.
If I divide this by 4, and let's go ahead and do that, 4 goes into 41, well, it would go in uh, 10 times with a remainder of 1. A remainder of 1 tells me what the power of i it would reduce to. The remainder is 1. It would be i to the first power. So this is equal to i. And that will work every time. And it's nice to have some rules in math that are infallible, that work every single time. What about i to the 62nd? Well, if I were to simplify that, I can simply divide 62 by 4. 4 goes into 62. Let's see. Um, 15 times with a remainder of 2. Well, a remainder of 2 tells me the power of i it reduces to. i squared is negative 1. This reduces to negative 1. So no matter what the power of i is, we can simplify it to one of these four. It's either i, negative 1, negative i, or positive 1. It's one of those four. All right, let's look at an example of where we might have to simplify it and where we use it. What if I had the square root of negative 9? Well, if I want to simplify that to something uh, that I can work with, I can always factor out that square root of negative 1. And now I can simplify it. Well, I know the square root of negative 1 is just i. And the square root of 9 is 3. So I have i times 3. And generally, we like to write it with the i at the end here, 3i. So the square root of negative 1 would simplify to 3i. And if we recall, this is a pure imaginary number because there is no a value. There is no real part to this. So let's look at what essentially I did here. If a is greater than 0, and my a in this case would be 9, the square root of negative a will simplify to i square root of a. That's what I had here. Here is i times the square root of that value. And I was able to simplify it a little further. So let's take a look at this example. Essentially, because we have a square root of a negative, I can just pull it out and call it i, the square root of negative 1. So I can say 3i square root of 12. By pulling out that square root of negative 1 and calling it i, now this is something I can work with. I can simplify this if necessary. Well, I know 12 is 4 times 3, and 4 is a perfect square. So I can simplify that. The square root of 4 is 2. I can bring that out from under the radical and multiply it by this coefficient. 3i times 2 is going to give me 6i square root of this factor I wasn't able to simplify. So here, we write the i in front because we don't want to confuse it and make one think that it might be under that radical. 6i square root of 3, I was able to simplify that. And now we don't have that uh, negative under the radical. We pulled it out as i. This example here, I want you to attempt it yourself. Um, it's a little simpler than this because we have a perfect square under there. So go ahead and simplify that one. Let's look at writing uh, complex numbers in standard form. You will be asked to write them in standard form. Standard form of a complex number is a plus bi, where a is the real part, b is the coefficient of the imaginary number, how many of those square roots of negative 1 we have. So let's look at this here. To write this in an a plus bi, we have to separate it to what is the real part of the number and what is the imaginary value. So if I look at this, well, the first thing I can do is I could say, well, they have this denominator, so I can split it up. 6 over 3 minus the square root of negative 3 over 3. Now, that square root of a negative tells me that's an i, so I can simplify that further. And I just pull it out as an i. And I'm going to put it right out here so we can see it's almost in this form, a plus bi. Actually, it is in that form, but we have to do some simplifying. a is 6 thirds. Well, 6 thirds reduces to 2. 6 divided by 3 is 2, minus the square root of 3 over 3 times i. Now that I've written it in standard form, I can actually identify what is the real part. The real part is 2. 
What is the imaginary coefficient? That would be negative square root of 3 over 3. This is a value that is real, but it is only a coefficient of the imaginary uh, unit. So we're multiplying it by the imaginary unit. Sometimes we'll have to add or subtract imaginary numbers. <clears throat> and when we do so, our final answer should always be in standard form, a plus bi. So the first thing you want to do if you have to add or subtract imaginary values is to simplify them. Put them into a plus bi form. Well, I look at this and I see the square root of negative 25. That can be simplified. So this is 6 plus the, uh, well, the square root of a negative is i. And the square root of 25, which is a perfect square, is just 5. So I wrote this number in standard form. Minus a minus i, that values already in standard form a plus bi. In this case, a is 8. And b is negative 1, that coefficient of i. Now I'm ready to add, or in this case, subtract imaginary numbers. Well, to add or subtract imaginary numbers, this imaginary number minus that imaginary number is no more difficult than combining like terms. 6 minus 8, make sure. You don't make a sign error. You distribute that negative. So 6 minus 8 would be negative 2. 5i minus a negative 1. Two negatives give me a positive. 5i plus an i would give me 6i. And we can see our final answer is in a plus bi form. I can identify the real part to be negative 2 and the imaginary coefficient to be a positive 6. Another thing we might see, or we will see, is Something of this nature. We're given an equation in two variables. And we might be asked to solve for x or solve for y. Well, the key to this one is to realize that what it's actually asking us to do is to identify the real part and then identify the imaginary part. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to rearrange this equation. Let's get those x's and y's on one side of the equation. Those are my variables. Everything else is not a variable. So I'm going to add 2x to both sides. So I just brought that over here, and it put it with the y. But I have to subtract 2 from both sides. So the terms that contain the x and y are now isolated to one side. And the other terms, and you can see it's written as an imaginary number, negative 2 plus 4i is on the other side. Now. When it asks me to solve for x or solve for y, it's telling me to find the real part. Because this value is an a value. It is the real part, a plus b i. The real part is 2x. Well, if this real part in an imaginary number is equal to another imaginary part, or an imaginary number, excuse me, this a has to equal that a. So now I can actually solve for x. To solve for x, I can divide both sides by 2, and I get x is negative 1. So we determine that x is negative 1 because negative 1 times 2, the real part, equals negative 2. Now, if we're asked to solve for y, that's saying find the imaginary part. Well, this is the imaginary coefficient. And this is the imaginary coefficient. They have to be equal to each other. So we're identifying the imaginary parts of these two imaginary numbers that are set equal to each other. And I can solve this for y by dividing both sides by negative 8. 4 divided by negative 8 is a negative 1 half when we reduce it. 4 over 8 is 1 half. I've identified y to be negative 1 half. That is the imaginary value on this side because it has to equal what's on that side. a plus bi equals a plus bi. And that's why we write them in standard form. So we can identify real parts compared to imaginary parts. So this has been section 6.6, .6, Introduction to the Complex Number System. Thank you for watching.